This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hey everybody, it's Aaron Norris with the Norris Group. I am here today with John Aronson. He is a general contractor, a licensed general contractor, and manufactured home contractor, a licensed real estate broker, and manufacturer manufactured home dealer. And John has been in the industry in all kinds of facets as well as his entire family for a really long time. We had him back on the show in January and February. It was a promise I made to him because he was awesome in helping us build a chapter on accessory dwelling units. Um, And he brings a really interesting angle because he's on the ground sort of helping homeowners and real estate investors decide what's best for them. And there's been a lot of updates. So John, thanks for joining us. Oh, I'm happy to be here. So, I mean, you oh, were only on a few months ago, but there are nine bills currently <laughs> in some form uh, in the state Senate and Assembly. Um, SB 13, uh, we just talked to uh, Senator Bob Wachowski, who's been a cheerleader for the ADU movement since the beginning. And uh, there's a lot of really interesting things specifically for real estate investors. In I think the most exciting one being that the owner occupancy rule Basically, the state is trying to regulate the cities to not allow, which is really interesting. What, do you get a sense? I mean, maybe you have no sense. Do you, <laughs> do you think that this is going to go through? Is it being received positively from your point of view? Well, I haven't seen any of these uh, bills being received positively by any of the jurisdictions that we work with. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I'm a no. It's it's a tug of war. They, they you know they are resisting it. They're, they're telling you know, people that the state's a bully and that a lot of them aren't really uh, you know, embracing it uh, anywhere near as much as they should. So SB 13 comes along at a very critical time. It's a perfect time. I, I have a few friends in the planning community and yeah, they, they really don't like that the state is forcing their hands and reaching into the, the municipality code. But the truth of the matter is uh, affordable housing is a, a multifaceted conversation and, it's I there's plenty of blame to go around, but this is a very interesting way to solve it. As so much so that in SB 13, as we talked uh, with Sir Bobukowski about, he was talking about making sure the language is clear that ADUs do count towards cities' uh, affordable housing goals. So, it you know it's it feels like there's some things in there for the cities as well, whether they take it that way or not. But um, now, what markets do you work in again? Uh, San Diego. Okay. Uh, county county wide, uh, we we don't venture out of San Diego. I mean, we're you know we're not huge contractors. We don't have branch offices or franchises or anything like that. We're just one family owned operation, and uh, we kind of kind of keep it close to the vest, if you will. Well, Linsa Bracknell, she's uh, the mastermind that hooked you and I together um, when I was building that chapter in September, and now we're working on this January 11th event with the San Diego Creative Investors Association, and we're all working really hard. Now, that event is specifically aimed a little bit more towards owner-occupants, and uh, I'm excited. I mean, the panel, um, let me see, the panel that we're I'm moderating, it's going to be the mayor of Encinitas, as well as one of her planners, uh, Jeff. Uh, Greg Nicholas with the state housing, uh, the California Department of Housing and Community Development. We've got a few finance people there and then a taxpayer's rights advocate. <laughs> I hope they don't fall asleep because some of those topics seem pretty boring. Um, but the target audience is owner occupied. And the reason that we're doing so many ADU focus is because I want to make sure that the investors on the streets are getting the information that they need. In, in your experience right now in San Diego, where, where are things getting stuck? Well, it, it's just overall, uh, things are moving along a lot better uh, today than they were the last time we spoke. Uh, th- there is, you know, compliance uh, starting to, to come about in pretty much all the jurisdictions. They're just uh, taking their time and in, enacting in, in a lot of them. And a lot of them are having a tough time trying to deal with uh, waiving entitlement fees and, and uh a developmental impact and, and environmental impact fees and things like that. And a lot of them are, you know, a lot of the public utilities wish they could uh, charge for new service and new meters and all that. And, and, and that, that kind of stifles uh, 
progress to some extent, but not to any major extent. The, our biggest problem is SDG and E. Really? They they are so backed up. Oh my God, they're so backed up, Aaron. It, it's ridiculous. They're two months. If I if I, I just called the other day for a client, we, we need to, uh, to have a temporary uh, deactivation for in order to do a crane set on a manufactured home in their backyard. It's less than ten feet from a power line. So SDG and E has to come out and disconnect it temporarily with a four-man crew and, and be there on standby during the whole process and then reconnect it. And that's a three to $5,000 added cost. And they can't always guarantee that they're going to show up on time. Uh. <laughs> it, this is ridiculous. Plus, it's a two-month two month wait to even get somebody to come out and evaluate the project. Oh, no. Wait. So you're just talking it's, about somebody showing up and saying, yes or no, this will work? Yeah, exactly. Now is that and, S- and giving you a price and giving you a price for it? SCG and E or the city? That's SCG and E. Wow! Across the board, I mean, it's, they're the biggest uh, debacle that's going on right now. And and I talked to them personally. There's nothing they can do about it. They're having manpower problems like everybody else in, in, in the state of California. They're having their labor issues, mm-hmm. and uh, you know they're they're having some turnover and then they're having some advancements and things like that. So it just keeps the the, the ball rolling just a little too fast and uh, they're not connecting all the dots it's co- and it's costing homeowners a lot of money. Well, I'm laughing in part because one of the caveats of bill uh, SB 13 is that the city's got, they have 60 days to, uh, well, I guess it's to approve the permit. I guess the city could approve the permit pending utility sign off. And I, and I know about this a little bit cause I, I have a family member in the utility business at Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, and I talked to their team over there. And for at least on their side, one of the issues, it's not necessarily a crane issue, but um, if you look overhead and there's a power line and somebody wants to build an ADU under it, there's a liability issue there. And if it's a a public owned utility, that means the liability would be to ultimately the ratepayers. So if the power lines fell, a fire, you know, happened and somebody got killed, um, the, the utility could get sued and therefore the rates of the consumers might go up. So I can understand that. And at least in LA, the conversation was between the mayor's office and the utility. The mayor's office would wanted somebody to sign a waiver, but I would also be uncomfortable with that. Yeah. It's all cute until somebody gets hurt and then people are looking for money. So <laughs> is are it yeah. sounds like a different issue though for S C G and E. It just sounds like they just can't get people out on site to look at the project and whether it's going to go forward or not. Well that, that that's part of it. And then another re- uh, your concern, I mean if you're paying uh, ten thousand dollars a trip uh, each way for a crane and you've got a truck with, with a with a you know a, a, a six hundred square foot ADU being uh, sitting on the street somewhere wait to get offloaded by that crane and they both show up and they're there when they're supposed to be and all the streets are blocked off and there's traffic control and everything's ready to go and then all of a sudden you get a call from SDG and he's saying that they're not going to be able to make it or they just don't show. <laughs> You're talking major problems. It's thousands of dollars. It's going to end up nasty. It's going to end up with a very unhappy client and a homeowner and probably end up in a lawsuit. And believe me, those are real uh, examples. They have happened. Now, for your business, who's calling you the most, real estate investors or the consumer? I'm getting, you know, I'm getting it from all sides. Uh, I say it's a, a good 50-50. I, I work with investors every day. I, I am an investor, as you know, myself. And uh, I'm looking at a property right now. Uh, it's a peach. It's got a, an old, decrepit, four-unit carport, and it's, it's, a, it's a duplex behind it, built in the 70s. And we want to, if I could make a play on it, I'd, I'd tear down that uh, those four uh, old um, carports and I'd replace them with a four-car garage and, and a 1,200-square-foot and a, and a, and a granny flat or, or ADU on top of the garage apartment. And that would increase the usability and revenue producing potential tremendously on that property. And we'll look at you not even getting rid of the parking. That's amazing. (laughs) Yeah. Not getting rid of the parking, making it better, making it enclosed garages instead of open carports and adding and, and, you know, accommodating the city's uh, uh, compliance because it's adding an extra dwelling on the property where there's already a duplex. 
Wow. Yeah. We had covered that last week that some real estate investors don't understand that this is not just meant for single family residents, but it can be, you can build an ADU on a duplex, triplex, or a fourplex. It doesn't matter. Yep. That's right. And it's a coastal area where they're getting pretty, you know, reasonable rents. It's not spectacular, as you probably well know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've, I've heard investors even out here in the Inland Empire, there are a few cities that <laughs> people are bringing in their permits and they're just rolling in their eyes because they didn't create the the local ordinance and they're just having to sign off on it. <laughs> so, uh, be, but they're being able to build something for around a hundred grand and it rents for, you know, $1,500 a month. That's a, yep. that'll work. <laughs> That, that, that's a good, you hit both numbers right on the head. <laughs> you ought to be in my business. <laughs> well, I think that's the target, but let's, um, I think this is, this piece of the conversation might take a little bit of time. So let's, um, I, I, cause I think there's a lot of noise out there. And I think one of the frustrations is that depending on which municipality you're working with, the conversation can be really different. Uh, just throwing it out there real quick, why I want to cover this. There's some cities that are looking at tiny homes being able to fill this ADU concept, but that's a municipality by municipality play. Um, tiny homes are regulated the same way an RV is, so it falls under DMV code, and it would fall upon the different ci- the different cities to make that allowable or not. As a real estate investor, that play is particularly interesting because. Uh, an RV or a tiny home doesn't trigger reassessment of the property. So let's, let's get into a little bit of the nerdiness. Um, let's talk about title 24, 25. So title 24 is the California building code where, um, those that's stick built. That's something where it's going to be on a pad and it's a stick built home, correct? And a modular. Correct. So modular is just where the walls are being built off site and you're basically bringing them in and constructing them like a regular house. It's just the walls were built off site. No, that's a, that's a prefab, Aaron. Oh, okay. Modular. The pre, the prefab is what they call a, a kit home or, or a flat stack where they, they do it. It's a series of floor wall and, and roofing components that are all flat stacked on a low, low bed trailer and hauled to the job site and then erected a, 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 a modular um, is much like a manufactured, except that it doesn't have a frame under it, and, and it doesn't. It's not uh, under uh, the auspices of, of Title 25. What a modular home, though, does fall under the same uh, Title 24 requirements as site built uh, homes do. Okay, that makes sense. Now I'm re- I'm very visual, so I'm remembering the book we created, and I remember looking at modular, so I understand. So I just. In my brain, it's like boxes, and you're stacking boxes next to each other or on top of each other for the modular. Okay. But yep. technically, a modular is a prefab, though, is it not? <laughs> uh, well, I guess they're all prefabricated <laughs> in the sense that they're, they're it's off-site construction. What, that's the big buzzword now today is off-site construction. Okay. That, that, yeah, that makes more that's sense. That's replacing factories built housing. Pardon me? Yeah, that's uh, that is what's confusing is sort of the prefab. It can fall under Title Twenty Four or Twenty Five, depending on. Well, let's get into Title Twenty Five. So, manufactured housing, um, mobile homes. Nobody uses that word anymore. They do, but it's it's incorrect now, right? That's not cool to say anymore. It's profanity. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well. It just makes me laugh. You had turned me on to Clayton Homes, and when I was out in Texas on a trip, um, they had a, a, a plant there. I didn't get to walk through, but I saw on the outside, and man, manufactured housing has definitely come a long way. <laughs> so it's not what I think people think of when, you know, in the 70s and 80s when they think of uh, manufactured homes. So some of these just look like a stick built. You really wouldn't know the difference. No, in the 60s, we used to call them wobbly boxes. Yep. <laughs> Because that's exactly what they were. They were real thin and light. They they weighed about ten thousand pounds. I mean, yeah, about ten, uh, about five tons. Mm-hmm. Ten thousand pounds per section. You know what? They, they weighed a day it's like over twenty five thousand pounds. Oh wow! Yeah, that's that's the difference in the construction. That's the difference. In the, you know, where's the beef? <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I, with your client stack right now, I guess let's look at the. The pros and cons of looking at something that's stick built, and this is why I like talking to you because you look at each site as it's sort of its own thing, and you're going to tell a client whether it's going to be more efficient, time effective, save 
money as well, looking at all those things to build a stick built or manufactured. If you're looking at an owner occupant, um, in, in general, are they leaning more towards the manufactured or the stick built? Well, from a cost standpoint, they all are very uh, hopeful about the manufactured element. It's a uh, a lot less costly. I could put a uh, uh, let's say a fourteen by forty foot or fifteen by forty six hundred square foot eighty in somebody's backyard uh, completely for under a hundred thousand bucks, mm. and that generally includes all the uh, utility work. And I, I use generally very cautiously because there are some. Uh, variables there that really do impact the overall cost of the uh, the overall project. And, you know, I mean, I'm talking twenty five to forty five thousand dollars, which is a huge yeah. gap. When you're talking about a hundred grand, spread, that's a but, <laughs> that's a big spread. A hundred grand is a big spread, but I mean, if you go site built, uh, and and we're in that business too. I mean, my my son is just as busy as he's ever been. And, He's doing uh, multiple uh, ADU projects, mostly retrofits, bringing some of the uh, uh, you know unpermitted, uh, non-conforming uh, ADUs up to code, uh, or just reconstituting them so they're legally rentable. But uh, it, it, it's a it's a fast-moving business. It's either way, and if I can't uh, put a manufactured home, I'm the first to admit it. I had to uh, you know give the customer uh, client the bad news just the other day. And tell them that they, they, it wasn't going to work for them, and then one, it was that same client uh, with the SDG and E situation. So it, 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 there's some cases where it just won't work. If you can't roll it in or crane it in, then you got to build it on site, or you can do a prefab, a, a, a kit home, or a flat pack. And when it's a Title 25, so a manufactured home, does that trigger uh-huh. re- reassessment of the primary residence, the whether the property? Uh, yeah, it goes it, because it has to be placed on a foundation. Okay. In order to to be per, to be permitted, you know, and, and and signed off, you got to have it on the approved uh, manufactured home foundation, which is not a poured in place stem wall or or slab on grade. It, it's uh, it's a mechanical. It's an approved and engineered uh, approved uh, mechanical uh, foundation system that, that goes underneath the uh, the home. Okay. Um, so then it can be reassessed. I've never really been through that process before. So looking at stick built compared to a manufactured home, how, how does the tax assessor look at that? Is it one more valuable than the other? Um, there's not always comps. So how are they evaluating that? Is it just price per square foot? They look at what the estimated primary and just carry it over to the, either the manufactured or stick built. You know, I really don't know, to be honest with you, Aaron, how they assess that or how they come to terms with it. Um, I would, I'm would, i thinking that probably, because it's all so new and there's very few manufactured AUs that I'm aware of that are even going in because of some of the, you know, the issues on site. So I, I imagine if it's on a foundation system, uh, that it would be assessed the same way as real estate would. Uh, I know one of the uh, individuals just to stray a bit, uh, who's going to be on our panel is an expert in that particular you know, the, the issue of uh, uh, appraisals and, and uh, assessments and stuff like that. And it's going to be interesting to to get his take uh, on, on on the 11th. But uh, I, I, I have a feeling that it's going to be assessed as a as, as an improvement and be assessed uh, according. Uh, 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 in the same way that a site built structure would be assessed. Okay. But it only in, if it, it, it's only assessed on the added square footage. It's not retroactive to the entire home. Okay. Got it. Understood. I, I didn't know the, I've never done that before. So didn't know what that looked like that. So you're just saying it's just the improvement. So it doesn't trigger a reassessment for tax purposes for the entire property. Correct. Okay. That's, that's my understanding. All right. Well, we'll check on that because that's that's really important, especially for owner yes. occupants who have been sitting on a home for forty years, and the play is that they want to build one of these. Actually, uh, we opened up the last call to SDCIA members as well as our members of the our Norris Group subscription, and there was a lady that called after, and it, the, it, she was concerned about it. Um, she was having problems in San Diego getting it built to start with. Um, they were saying that she couldn't do it and she was frustrated, but um, they're, 
they're trying to be as most cost efficient as possible because they want to age in place. <laughs> so she was debating whether or not to live in the ADU in the back and rent out the primary or, you know, there's so many different options, which are really cool. Um, let's talk about financing real quick while we're on this. So a real estate investor, I, I've only seen stick built right now. And throwing it out there again, I haven't seen an issue with the appraisal coming back. It seems like the appraisal is just coming back based on a price per square foot. They just sort of carry it over into the back. And um, they even with there's not a lot of comps in the area, they're, the appraisals are coming back as expected. It's the financing that's become an issue, um, even if it's to a, a, a primary with a stick-built ADU. Um, a lot of lenders are looking at, looking at it like a duplex. So if it's an owner-occupant who wants to come in, they're wanting a significant amount down. Uh, so if it's a first-time home buyer, it sort of kicks them out, unfortunately. Um, but when we introduce, I, I think that'll work itself out in time. I think lenders just have to get used to seeing this and see the opportunity that's ahead. But when it comes to manufactured home, I almost want to warn investors, you have to see it coming um, because some lenders just don't like mixed inventory. Is that uh, your understanding as well? Well, no, you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, that That is an issue. Uh, appraisals are an issue. Uh, always have been. Uh, funding is an issue uh, with, with some lenders. Some lenders it isn't. Um, you know, it, it just depends on the situation. But uh, until, in fact, it, it applies to just site-built uh, ADUs as well, until there's enough of them out there for for people to, to you know, comp with. It, it's really, a, you know, a, 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 you know, a crapshoot. But I, I like what you said about you know, the appraisers at least are, you know, wrapping their arms around the fact that there's that improvement involved and they're giving it the added value. That should help uh, with with the lending aspect, I would think. It'll be interesting because I don't, I haven't talked to anybody yet. I know people who are building um, junior ADUs, so that's when you're converting a garage into a living unit. Um, I want to see not, some... Not a garage. Sorry? Not, not, not a garage. Unless it's an attached garage, if it's an attached garage, then it is a junior accessory dwelling unit. Yeah, that's. A, I'm detached, sorry. Attached. Okay. Yeah, then it's then it's an ADU. Got it. So yeah, this is an attached garage. I have not seen an appraisal on that because technically, you're also getting rid of possibly an asset to the building that people would want to buy. So I don't know how an appraiser is looking at that. I will have to check that. I know a few of those. <laughs> so if you were to get rid of the garage and convert it into a junior living unit, um, would that affect the appraisal to the negative? Because it's seen as you're sort of getting rid of a, a, what's the word I'm looking for? A selling point of the property. I don't know. Well, yeah, it, it's it's like a swimming pool. I mean, there, sometimes there's value added for a pool. Other times there's value deducted. You know how that works. And, okay. and I, I think it's kind of the same way for an ADU right now. I just, I, it, until we get enough of them out there where, where lenders and appraisers can, can kind of have, you know, su substantial comps to choose from. And unfortunately, a lot of the, uh, even if there's a lot of ADUs in a given area, if they're dated, I mean, if it was 20 years ago since they built the ADU, they, uh, from what I understand, the appraisers can't even count that. Right. Well, you know, this first segment is about done. So uh, you have a really great short of short books uh, that I think is a really cool read. So if people want to get a hold of you and find out how to get that book, how would they reach you? Oh, uh, just go on our website, uh, www.crestbackyardhomes.com. Open up any page and uh, there's a tab on the right, uh, a red tab that says ADU Guide. And then you just download that guide, and uh, that's a step-by-step -step, uh, process. It's everything I do when I go out to analyze or, or uh, evaluate a property uh, to build an ADU. There's a, there's a certain protocol I use uh, to, you know, to determine what it's going to cost to to do it. And that, this ADU guide is that step-by-step -step process. If you if a person was a real handy person, they could go through that. Uh, every step of the way, and they probably end up saving themselves about five thousand dollars on all, a lot of the 
uh, uh, upfront fees that you either pay a contractor or a consultant to do it, yeah, or an architect. Yes, and it, it gives you a really great starting point of walking you through the process if you're new to it, uh, especially if you're an owner-occupant. It's easy on the eyes, and it's not difficult to understand, so I really liked it. So I'm excited about the next show because we're going to talk about a prefab plant and a lot more, so we'll see you next week. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com.